let's begin our message. Uh, we are starting a new message series until Easter. And this message series is called In, Not Off. Okay? And the idea is that the Bible talks about that we live in the world, but we're not off the world. There's a big difference there. We live inside the world. We can't escape that, okay, until we die. We live inside this world. But we don't, we're not off the world. In other words, we don't believe or live out like the world does. And so that's Paul was going to uh, address. And this particular topic is a very, I want to warn you right for up front, that this uh, topic is going to be very, you know, like for some of us, maybe uncomfortable to hear, but it has to be dealt with. And I'm talking about specifically sexual sin in the church. Okay, we know that sexual sin is happening outside the church, but this is particularly in the church. And you may be wondering, is it really? Is that happening in the church? Well, Paul's going to talk about it. And, 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 and I want to preach the Word of God, and we can't just skip it, right? Because it's right there in 1 Corinthians 5. So we're going to deal with that uh, sexual sin in the church. And so um, uh, my proposition today is called, you got to be cruel to be kind. Okay, you got to be cruel to be kind and from 1 Corinthians 5. But before we read the scriptures in English, um, I remember uh, years ago when I was in high school, there was a song that has this, um, uh, the lyrics. And I want to play for you. It's a, it's a sound bit. It's just about 15, 20 seconds. This is what it says. It's supposed to be playing right now. I can't sing it for you, but <laughs> okay, guys. Anyways, um, never mind about the song then. It, it, it did, I mean, they said it worked before and everything, but it's one of those things. All right. So this song is a 1979 song that says you, uh, you got to be cruel to be kind, okay, and in the right measures. And you got to be cruel to be kind because that's to show you that I love you. And, um, you know, I was listening to it when I was young, and I didn't understand what it really means. And um, I don't know the context itself, but the idea is that sometimes you got to do cruel things in order for us to be kind. And this is what Paul's going to talk about. And so let's all stand together as we read in English uh, in honor of God's word for 1 Corinthians 5. This is what it says. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you and immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would have been removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I wish you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. You do, uh, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the whole leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in the unleavened. Uh, for Christ our Passover has also been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for your words. I pray, God, that you will prepare us, our hearts and minds, so that as we receive this word, it's not in a condemning way, but in a convicting and encouraging way so that we can live right before you. Thank you so much, Lord. Have your way upon us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As always, I like, to, uh, as Paul begins a new uh, uh, chapter here, uh, I want to talk to you about the context. If you remember that uh, we've, been, uh, the, we've been for several months talking about 1 Corinthians from first one, uh, chapter 1 all the way to chapter 4 last that we ended. So now in, first, uh, in chapter 1 to 4, he talks about, he, he, he addressed the disunity in the body of Christ. But now he switches gear and he confronts, he talks about sexual sin in the body of Christ, in the church itself. So I'm going to talk to you about the context here. You have to remember that in the Greek time, in where Paul was living, uh, sex was considered like pretty much like a, 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 a physical urge. It's just like eating or drinking, okay? So um, just if you're hungry, you go get some food, right? If you're, if you're thirsty, you get a drink. Well, in those days, in that time, that's exactly what they do. If they have an, uh, 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 an urge to have sex, especially the men, they just go and do it with anybody they want, okay? And their, their, even their act of worship, you remember, the temple itself uses uh, a sex and a prostitute there as a form of worship. So that's how crazy they were living in, in that society. 
But I want to say that today we're living in such a crazy society as well. You know, uh, everything we see right now in, in our society is pretty much geared or, uh, towards sexuality, you know, and, and how people joke about it. And you hardly can watch any movies or anything, you know, on, online that without any some kind of sexual uh, tone. And so uh, you probably know of Hugh Hefner. Hugh Hefner was the man who started Playboy magazine. You know, I don't know what kind of um, intensity of hell he'll be in because, you know, he obviously, uh, from his work, you know, uh, his gift and skills, he, um, uh, you know, a lot of men have fallen in this area. But he said this. He said that the major civilizing force in the world is not religion, it is sex. In addition to that, he said that sex is a biological necessity. Find yourself a girl who's like-minded and let yourself go. It's no different than eating and drinking. That's the society that we live in today. And so the, the, the Corinthians were having problems with that because they were believers. They were Christians. They believed in Jesus, but they could not leave that old lifestyle, that, lo, that, that immoral lifestyle. And unfortunately, today in our community, in our society, in, in our uh, context, we're having the same problem. Christians, yet, you know, they, they claim to be Christian, they believe in Jesus Christ, they believe in the Word of God, but they're still living in immorality in the church. And, and uh, Paul will address this, and we should not be shy about it, and we need to confront this so that we will not fall under the judgment. You know, let me read you some statistics. You know, it says here that pornography industry alone generates $12 billion of dollars of revenue per year. $12 billion, the pornography industry. That's not even including prostitution and all kind of stuff. This is just the porn stuff. $12 billion, imagine that. 66% of internet used by 18 to 34, 34 years old look online pornography at least once a month. Okay? 70% of internet pornographic, uh, pornographic traffic occurs during the 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. That's during the work time. 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., that's when 70% 70, 70 of porn traffic occurs. So people at work are looking through this stuff. The percentage of internet sites that are pornographic in nature right now is 12%. So 12% out of all the millions of uh, internet sites are porn. 2.5 billion emails per day are pornographic related in some way. 2.5 billion emails a day are sent out that are porn related. And here's the kicker for the, the last two. More than half of the men who identify themselves as evangelical, uh, evangelical Christian admit that they have an addiction to porn and use it at least last week for the self-satisfaction. And here's the last one. 55% of Christian pastors admitted to visiting pornographic sites. So, is there a problem in a church with sexual sin? Yes. And you will learn more about this, and we need to learn how to confront it and deal with it. So, what do we do with sexual sin in a church? From the scripture we read, I see three things. Number one, we need to confront it. We need to expose it. We can't hush-hush about it. We need to, explain. when you want to, you know, if, if you have a, a cancer, you can't just hide it. Why? Because it's going to kill you, right? we got to go to the doctor. God has to expose it. He has to take MRI, x-ray, whatever, and, and said, hey, look, you got tumors uh, all over your body or your lung, your brain, whatever it is. That's, you know, you got to confront it. You have to deal with reality. And this is what Paul said. He said, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you. The word reported here in the Greek is in a uh, present tense. It means it's an ongoing thing. Paul was saying, look, basically I've been getting emails from you guys that there, there are immorality in the church. I've been getting all these texts. It's ongoing. It's not just a one-time uh, uh, event. Paul said it was ongoing constantly. It was reported that there is immorality among you, okay? And look at the word that he used, immorality here. It's, a, it's, it's the Greek word that many of you know is called porneia. Now, porneia is basically where we get the word porn or pornography. But the root word, which is uh, porne, means a harlot for hire, and the masculine form pornos means a male prostitute. But it becomes the generic term that it's used basically with all kind of sexual deviation, that is outside of marriage. It includes uh, fornication, adultery, incest, homosexuality, and bestiality. 
Now, fornication, in case you don't know what that is, fornication is basically sex between unmarried people. Uh, adultery is uh, sex within married people, but not with their spouse. But in this case, Paul was addressing incest. That's having sex with pe uh, people who are related to you. And Paul's going to deal with that. And so this is what's, what is happening. And so Paul says here that uh, it's been reported there's immorality among you. And look what he says. Immorality of such a kind that does not even exist among the Gentiles. So Paul was saying that, you see, um, the, 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 the Roman, in the Roman Empire, the Romans do not permit or allow incest. And yet in the church, it was tolerated. And so Paul was disgusted that the church was tolerating this. Even the Romans was not even doing it. And so Paul addressed this. He confronted. He says, look, even the, the Gentiles don't do it. So what most likely happened here was that there was a, a mom and dad who has a son. And as the son was growing up, maybe the mother died. And then so the father, years later, married a younger woman. But then there is a, an ungodly attraction between the son and the stepmother. So the phrase there, uh, someone has his father's wife, refers to a stepmom. Because if it's a direct biological mother, it would say uh, his mother. But so what, it's a phrase, when he says his father's wife, that means he's his stepmother. So the son and, and stepmother had this ungodly attraction. And then the, 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 uh, the, the tense here, has, is also a, a uh, perfect tense, that means it's an ongoing thing. So what most likely happened is that the father and, the, uh, and his wife got a divorce. And now she's shacking with the son. And so what kind of crazy thing was that happening? That her, the father actually lost his wife to his son. And so church, Paul was so disgusted, not so much that it happened, the incest, but the church was tolerating it, allowing it, and they were proud about it. And so Paul says, we need to deal with this. And you know what, church? Right now in our society, we're doing the same thing. We're doing things that animals don't even do. Homosexuality I'm talking about. Animals don't do that. But human beings are doing it, and we're proud. We even dedicate a day where we can be uh, uh, proud about it and have a parade. And it's so normal. Animals don't do that. Church, as Christians, we need to hate the sin that God hates. Not the sinners. We need to love the sinners. We need to reach out to them. We need to pray for them. We need to, you know, try to lead them to Christ. But we need to hate the sin. And we can't tolerate that sin. And we need to be disgusted. Because if we're not disgusted, you pretty soon you become numb. And pretty soon you will look at, look at it as if it's normal. You know, uh, one of my uh, daughter's favorite show is called The Voice. I don't know if you heard The Voice before, okay? And um, I don't watch it, but when I'm passing the living room, and they're watching, and so I might stop for a minute or two and listen and watch. And so I, I know what it's about, that kind of thing. But they always watch The Voice. So just this week, I was, you know, I was, it was one of those one or two minutes, I stood there and I was looking. There was this beautiful girl, attractive girl, very sweet looking girl, and she sang, and the judges turned around, and they were talking and everything, and then, and as I was walking away, I think uh, the judges were making fun of her with Nick Jonas, okay? Not my Nicholas, okay? Nick Jonas, okay? And I said, hey, maybe you and Nick Jonas can, you know, it's whatever. And then th th this girl said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gay. And everybody said, oh, okay, I see. And, and, and as I heard that, I, I was, there was this perk in my heart. I was like, oh. I mean, she has such a beautiful voice. She's pretty. But she's proud to say she's gay. Church, what I'm saying to us as a church is that we need to hate what God hates. We need to be careful. We need to understand that, you know, church, again, that we love the sinners, but we need to hate, the, you know, the, the, the sinful behavior. Because if not, we begin to tolerate it. And when we tolerate this thing, then pretty soon we will allow it and we don't even become to be disgusted. Paul, uh, 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 Jesus addressed the seven churches in Asia Minor, okay, which is the, the modern-day Turkey. One of the churches is called Tatara. And this is what Jesus said about this church. The, uh, this, God says that this church is, a, is very active, is very loving, is very faithful. But look what he said. Okay? I know your deeds and your love and faith and the service and perseverance. And that you de your, de uh, your deeds of late are greater than at first. But look at verse 20. 
But I have this against you that you what? Tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servant astray to, to, so that they commit acts of immorality. See, it happens then already. Not just in Corinth, but here, even this church. That they were tolerating this teaching of Jezebel that lead people, his people, God's people, to commit immorality. And so God says, you know, I'm going to judge them. I'm going to send them sickness and tribulation and pestilence if you do not repent. Church, I want you to know that this is happening today. Sexual sin being tolerated even in the church. I'm going to invite Gloria right now to come and just give a very short testimony of what her experience is. Microphone is right there. Um, and, uh, you know, when she was living in Tennessee. Good morning, church family. Uh, you know, in 2000, I think it was 2004 to 2006, I attended a church in Memphis, Tennessee. And as I attended that church, there was a new pastor that had come on. And the church told him, you're not to pastor. You're only to preach. And we lead the church. Inside of that church was sexual sin that was just very prevalent. We had people that were dating each other's husbands and wives in the choir sitting next to each other. And they knew and accepted that. We had people in there that were Masons, and they came in, and they uh, had meetings in the church. And as the pastor tried to do something about it, they would tell him, we will just vote you out. We voted you in. But the thing that was really, really difficult for me was there was a woman, a very beautiful young lady, and she had been larger in her life, had lost weight. And she said, well, my mom said, use my, use my gift that I have to use that gift while I have it. And so she was considered the church prostitute. She would actually service you in the parking lot of the church. And I began to pray in that church and said, Lord, you need to close it down. This is not a church. This is Satan's a deception for people coming in because it's listed as a First Baptist church. And yet people were coming in and doing everything. And eventually that pastor was locked out of the church. There were judges and political people in that church. And they got a court order to lock out the pastor. And on that particular Sunday, he came out onto the, um, into the, the parking lot, and he had service there and was never let back in the church again. And so it's prevalent today. That was just in 2006. I checked before this morning, and that church is still open. And people are still there and doing the same things. So we have to pray, and we have to stop for ourselves and say, Lord, I don't want to be like that, and I will not tolerate that. And so this pastor, even though he was put out of the church, he made a stand, and his stand was, this is not correct, and this is not biblical. And although he was excommunicated, he stood for Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, yeah, when Gloria was part of our teaching team uh, meeting, you know, and I, when I heard that story, when she shared to the team, I was just shocked. I said, well, you got to share that. This is happening right now in churches, Baptist churches as well. And we can't just keep our eyes closed, and we can't tolerate it. We need to expose it. We need to confront it and deal with it. But I'm praying right now as I'm speaking that uh, if the, any of us are involved, in, inside or outside the church. May God speak to each one of us so that we can repent, so that we can be saved, in a sense, from that horrible sin. So what do we do next, what Paul talks about? First, you've got to confront it, but secondly, he says you've got to basically cut it off. When it comes to sin, you've got to chop it off. You can't, you know, be nice to it. Oh, can you please leave? Okay. You cut it off. You can't wean it out. You know, uh, every January or so, usually I feel like the Lord leads me to uh, uh, an extended period of fasting. And the way I do it is that I slowly enter into the fasting mode, right? What I do is that, you know, first week I will take out the sweets and all, all entertainment. And the second week, on top of that, I will take out the red meat. The third week, I'll take out uh, all animal product. Fourth week, I will take out all cooked uh, um, food, right? And by the fifth week, so, you know, I, I basically wean myself slowly into that so that my, I'm preparing my body. And we do that, Oko, right? When we want to go running, if you want to train for marathon, you don't run 26 miles up front, right? You go one mile, two miles, and so on. But when it comes to sin, you don't wean your sin out. 
You don't say, okay, look, maybe instead of watching porn once a week, I'll do it every other week. And then after a while, I'll do it only once a month. And after a while, I'll do it every other month, and hopefully it'll go away. Do you think that will work? It will never work. Sin always wants to come back. Sin will, sin's job is that it will take over your life because it wants to put us in bondage. That's the function, the role of sin by Satan. So you can't deal with it, you know, uh, uh, kindly. You got to chop it off. And this is what Paul says. He says, in the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I, and, and I with you in, in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided, here it is, to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So basically, he says, I'm going to cut him off. You need to do this. He said, when you assemble together, you know, to deliver such a person who is committing this uh, uh, immorality to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, you may wonder, what, how in the world do you do that? How do you, how do you deliver someone to Satan? Let me explain to you. Uh, there is a concept, uh, there's, a concept, there's a principle in Matthew 18, how to do church discipline. And in case you never heard it or seen it before, church discipline is done, uh, first of all, the first step is one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, and this is what the text says in Matthew 18. If your brother sin against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. So there it is. So if somebody sin against you or you see somebody, you know, doing some kind of sin, you as a first eyewitness, you need to confront that person one-on-one -on -one in private. Okay, that's the way it's supposed to be done. But he says here, if he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So if he does not listen, if that person does not uh, willing to change after one uh, private confrontation, then it says here you're supposed to bring one more witness or two more, you know, one or two more witnesses. So basically it's two or three on one. And, and the key here is that the person you bring into the picture is, has to be another witness, not just somebody on your side, not somebody who will agree with you, but it's somebody who will actually, uh, somebody who, will, who actually saw uh, the sin committed, whether it's stealing, whether it's immorality or something else. And this is based on Deuteronomy. And uh, the way the Bible tells us is that you, one witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense. He may, uh, he may have committed a matter must be established by a testimony of two or three witnesses. So that's why then you bring another one or two more witnesses into the picture. So that's what happened. So you have two or three on one, right? But if that doesn't work, then finally, the last step, it says that we need to bring the church on that one person. And this is what the text actually says. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, Treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So that's the key here. Treat him as if he's a pagan or tax collector. It means that you have to cut him off from the church membership. I mean, you still love the person, you, just like you loving a, 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 a sinner that you're reaching out to, but he can't be part of the fellowship in an in intimate way. He can't be part of the church when it comes to the leader, leadership or the serving. He can't be up here leading worship or, or, or you know, uh, in music, whatever it is, because he is now a, a sinner. He is now a, a, an outsider in that sense. And that's what Paul meant over here when he says to deliver such one to Satan. Because uh, you have to remember that, that Satan owns this world right now. Remember when Satan tempted Jesus in the, in the desert and in the third temptation, G uh, Satan said, Jesus, look at all this world. This is all given to me. This is mine. <clears throat> and if you're willing to bow down before me and worship me, I will give it to you because it's mine. So in other words, when Paul says, I deliver such one to Satan, he's basically delivering him into the world. Because Satan owns the world, right? So it's not like going to a cult or going to some kind of witch, you know, wicked type of thing. But he's actually just delivering to the world. He's cut off from the fellowship. Why? So that the destruction of his flesh, so that one day he may be saved. I mean, if he's truly born again, of course he's saved. But hoping that when Satan begins to afflict pain in his body, he will come back to the Lord. And you may wonder, is that ever happened in the Bible? Yes. Think about, for example, here, uh, destruction of his flesh. Think about Job. Now, Job wasn't sinning, but think for a moment here. 
Satan and God made a deal. Satan cannot touch Job until he asks permission from God. And, God. and they said, well, you know, God is because he loves you because you bless him so much. And God finally said, fine, let's, let's have a, a bet. Not a bet, but you know what I mean? Let's, let's do this, okay? So um, you can do whatever you want to do to him. Just don't kill him, right? With the second, ro- the second round, that's what he said. So, you can do. so what did Satan do? First, he took all his business destroyed all his animals and everything. So he lost his, basically his money, his financial stability. Second, he took his family. His sons and daughters were all killed in a hurricane, right? And then finally, he took away his, uh, Satan began to inflict, you know, destruction of his flesh. He got boils all over his body. He was so sick. But he kept, but, but he could not touch his soul. And that's what happened here, church. The, 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 with the hope so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And so, church, when you think about this for a moment, this actually happened in the New Testament. If you remember the prodigal son, he left the father's house, and he went into the world, enjoyed the world, until a famine came, and then this man, as you know, the destruction of his body, in a sense, because he was starving right? And he was living with the pigs. He was eating with the hogs. And he must be filthy and dirty and maybe sick because he was famished and and hungry and starving. And that turned him back to the Father so that he went back to the fellowship with the Father and was restored. That is the idea here. So that when this man, this person who's living in immorality, were unwilling to repent, is kicked out from the fellowship, and treat it so that Satan will be able to destroy, in a sense, his physical body, but his soul will be saved. You know, uh, we don't know what happened to this man, but it was very interesting that in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul talks about such a man. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2. He says, if anyone has caused grief, he has not much grief me as he has grieved all of you to some extent. Not to put it into severely, but look what he says here. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now, instead of you ought to forgive him, comfort him, and he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow, I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love. So what happened here, probably, Paul was talking about a person that was basically punished by the body of Christ. Like he says, majority is sufficient. So maybe he's talking about this man that was very, uh, that was kicked out. And this person who was kicked out, you know, kind of like, decided to come back, and Paul now said, hey, accept him now, forgive him now, love him. Okay, that's what he was probably talking about. Now, church, um, you may feel like, isn't that extreme, Pastor? You know, why you want to cut off, you know, you have got to be more loving, more tolerant, more kind. May I remind you what Jesus said in Matthew 18? And if your hand and your foot causes you to sin, what is it to do? Cut it off and throw it away. This is Jesus talking. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into eternal fire. As, and if your eyes, you know, basically cause you to sin, he says, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell of fire. That's Jesus. Jesus said, do whatever is needed, even though it's painful and severe, but do it to save the body. It is better to be crippled but alive than going to hell with a complete body. I don't know if you saw the movie uh, maybe 10 years ago uh, based on true stories called 127 Hours. I watched it. If you haven't seen it, you can take a look. It's pretty, it's a true story about a young man who was hiking in Utah, I think, and then he fell into this crevice and then a rock fell on his right hand and he was stuck there for 127 hours. He, was, he couldn't do anything. His hand was stuck. You know, he screamed, yelled. There was, his phone has no signal, and, and he just couldn't do anything. He, and he was just 127 hours, about four or five days. And he tried. He even drank his own urine to stay alive. But he was hallucinating. He was just losing it. And, and finally, he has to make a choice. Either die there with his two hands together or do something that is extreme. And so that's what he did. He first broke his bone, so snapped it, and he took his pocket knife and started cutting away his skin. And he walked away. 
And there he is. He lost his right arm, his right hand. But he gets to live and tell the story about it. And maybe become rich from the movie. <laughs> right? Yes, he's missing a hand. Yes, maybe it's not really nice to lose a hand, but he's alive. And he can live a pretty close to a normal life, probably. But he's alive. Or he could be stuck there with two hands and become a carcass. What would you choose? Would you do it? It depends how much you want to live. Yes, it's extreme. Yes, it's painful. But sometimes it has to be done. You've got to be cruel to be kind. Because if you want to let the, for the good of the body, you need to deal with it. You know, over the years, I have to do this. As a pastor, I don't like confronting. But I have to do it. There's a couple I have to confront you know, because they're living together. And, and sure enough, you know, within a week or two, they never came back again. I did it kindly. Aaron and I have to confront somebody in the worship team. You know, this is years ago. You know, that was living in sin. And we did it kindly. I consult with the worship pastor here. And he said, yeah, I would do it. The same way I, you did it. But again, that person left. And several families left. And, and I, I, not a good thing said about me because, you know, what I, how I dealt with it. But church, I got to deal with it. That's my job. That's my responsibility. I am accountable to God. I can't let sin, you know, continue in this church. We deal it with love, but still, if the person is unwilling to, to, to repent, then we got to cut it off. You got to be cruel to be kind because I want to protect the sheep. I want to protect this fold to make sure that cancer will not grow and kill the body. And that's what Paul did. Lastly, so you got to confront it, okay, expose it. You got to cut it off. And lastly, Paul talks about you got to clean yourself off, okay? You got to clean, deal with it, and clean or cleanse, depending which translation you use. So there's a few things that he said about cleaning. Number one, uh, the way you do that is, uh, first of all, don't boast. Don't be prideful. This is what he said in verse uh, 6. Your boasting is not good, okay? Remember, these Corinthians, they are so proud of themselves. They talk about their spiritual gifts. Oh, I can prophesy. Oh, I can speak in tongue. Oh, you know, I have all these leaders and da 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 But Paul said, shut up. You, you're too boastful. You're so boastful that you can't even see the sin that is, you're tolerating in the, in the body of Christ here, in the church. You know, remember that boast uh, of pride is, the, is the, basically the root of how Satan fell. And when we are living in that uh, prideful mode, you know, we are so blinded to ourselves. If you remember a few weeks ago when we talked about pride or uh, humility, I said to you that uh, pride produces ungodly view of self, ungodly view of others, and ungodly comparison. Remember that. So when it comes to the first point here, ungodly view of self, when, uh, when, we, uh, when we are prideful, we, we can't see our blind spot. And that's when we fall. Okay, because Paul talks it in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Be careful. Don't be so prideful. Because that's when you're going to fall. You know, it's interesting. This morning I was meditating on Matthew and, and, um, for my devotional. And uh, there was a point where when, when Peter, when, 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 when uh, Jesus was talking to his disciples and said, you know, I'm going I'm to be basically arrested and killed and so on. And Peter said, Lord. That will never happen. I will never run away from you. Even though everybody else will flee, and, but me, I will die for you. And then what did Jesus say to him? Peter, I tell you that before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. No, no, Lord, no, not me. They all can run, but not me because I'm Peter. I walk on water. So I will never deny you. Well, you know what happened the rest of the story. He denied Jesus three times. So be humble. You know, Galatians put it this way. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. And the word gently here in terms, some translation says humbly. When you're doing it, do it humbly. Because be careful. Don't feel like, oh, it'll never happen to me. Why are you doing that kind of sin? Man, I would not do that. No, do it humbly. You know, I'll never forget this lesson. Um, many years ago, I was really young, you know, back in the, when I just became a pastor. Uh, I was talking to a fellow pastor of, uh, in the same building. We, we used the same church. Uh, to, 
So anyway, um, there was a, a at that moment, there was a, a, a Christian leader who fell into sin and immorality. And I was talking to my uh, pastor friend of mine. I said, oh, you know, I said, can you imagine this guy? Did you, you, know, do you, hear, did you hear that person, you know, blah, 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 and, and all that kind of thing. And he just listened to me. And then he said something that really hit me until today, and I keep and I remember. He said, Ed, don't have that attitude, he says. If you and I are given the same position like he has, if you and I have given the same opportunity he has, if you and I have the same fame and, and, and popularity like he does, you and I can fall just as easily. It is only by the grace of God that you and I are not in his position. And that really, really hit me hard. I think you're absolutely right. We need to be humble. Lord, thank you. I am grateful that, you, that you know, I'm not in that position. I'm grateful that you, are, you have kept me pure or protected me. Don't ever think, oh, that will never happen to me. I'm, you know, I'm above that. I mean, church, that's what happened, right? And so we need to, to be careful and learn from this that, number one, we cleanse ourselves by avoiding being prideful. Number two, I would say Paul talks about here is don't compromise. Don't begin to compromise. This is what he said. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? A little leaven. It starts with little things, but it will spread and basically leavens the whole lump, the whole dough. Little sin will always produce bigger sin, and it will produce more kids, and because more sin, and more sin, more sin. That's how it starts. That we talked about Ravi Zacharias last week. I don't believe, like I said, people don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what, ah, today I'm going to commit adultery. Let's do it. No, it starts with little things. Most people don't have a blowout in their tires. It's a little slow leak. It's leaking bit by bit until eventually you have a flat tire. It starts with maybe an innocent meeting with, a, with your coworker, your secretary, whatever it is. Before you know it, you're a little flirty. Oh, it's not going to harm, just a little flirt. Before you know it, you start texting. Before you know it, you start sexting. Before you know it, let's meet somewhere. Before you know it, you go all the way. That's how it always starts. Compromise. So don't compromise. A good example of this is King David. Look at how it started. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab instead, basically. And look at the last line. But David remained at Jerusalem. He compromised. It was his job, his duty as a king. He is supposed to lead the troops to, to battle. But he said, you know what? I'm successful now. I'm going to send my general. So he stayed behind. The first, the first up step. Look at the next step. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch. He was walking on the roof of the king's house, and he saw, you know, from the roof, he a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. He could have stopped. He saw that beautiful woman bathing, very attractive. His hormone goes. He goes, oh, you know what? I need to walk away like Joseph. He just go walk away. Just walk away. But he said, no, i got to find out. He said, you know, you, you may not be able to stop. There's a scene. When you're watching a movie or an internet, and suddenly there was a, a scene, you, you may not be able to, to stop it for us. But David clicked on it. Oh, that looks good. Let me click on it. That's basically what he did. He sent and he inquired, who is this woman? Because he wants to know more. And look what the next compromise. And one said, is not Beth Bathsheba, the daughter of Elan, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And look at the next step, number four. So David sent messengers, okay? So basically he clicked, and he basically said, I want to get into it more. So he stayed on. He could have walked away, but he did not. He compromised deeper. And so sure enough, he took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. He went all the way, right? Basically, you you not only click, you now you subscribe because you want to watch the whole thing. That's how it began. Little compromise will lead to the next one. And you know the rest of the story. She came back and said, I'm pregnant, Dave. <gasps> he could have stopped right there again. He could have said, I sinned. I'm so sorry. It's just embarrassing. You know, my, my soldier and I, you know. But again, he said, call Uriah. And he tried his scheme. 
you basically call him, come back, hey, how's it? You know, how's the war? Tell me about the report, about what's going on in the front line, blah, 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 blah. He said, okay, why don't you go home and, and, and just enjoy your wife a little bit. But he was such an honorable man, more honorable than David, that he would not sleep with his wife. And he slept there in the doorpost, you know, and, and, and David says, why you dare? I mean, I, I can't sleep, with, you know, while my comrades are fighting in the front line, I can't go. And so David said, come on in, let's eat some more. And he got him drunk. But even when he was drunk, he was not willing to sleep with his wife because he was such an honorable person. So David finally wrote the ultimate scheme. He wrote a letter. Here, can you imagine you carrying your own death sentence? Or Uriah was carrying his own letter that is supposed to go to the, the general, right? And the letter basically says, General, okay, you put Uriah in the hardest front line and then leave him behind so that he will get killed. It was a murder plot. That's David. How did it start? It? Little compromise. You know what? I don't need to go to war. It's not my job anymore. After all, I'm a king. I need to take a break, right? But look what happened. It led. So don't start, church. Don't compromise. Deal with it. You know what? The last one is, after not boasting, not compromising, but lastly, is that you, need to, you do need to clean your mind. This is what Paul says. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. How do you clean up your old life? Because you, when you become a Christian, you have a new spirit. But your mindset can still be an old mindset like the Corinthians. They were still living in the old mindset, and you got to clean your mind. And so Paul talks about that in Romans 12. Do not conform to the world, right? The pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind because the mind is always the battlefield. In our mind, there is always this battle between God's word and the Satan's word, between temptation and God's word. You know, I don't know if it's really an arm wrestle, but you know the idea, right? The point is that there is a fight, there's a battle in there. You know, if you fill your mind more with the lust of this world, right, you, with the things you watch and listen and all kind of stuff like that, well, guess who's going to win? But if you fill your mind regularly with the word of God and prayer and good fellowship and hearing great messages and so on and so on, then, you know, the spirit will win. It's like the, the, the illustration of the two dogs, a black and white dog that is fighting. Which dog will win? It's the dog that you feed the most. If you feed the dog, you know, the black dog more than the white, then the, dog, uh, the black one will eventually win and vice versa. It's the same thing like this. But the way you wash it, the Bible says, is through the word of God. Because in Ephesians 5, Paul says, Husband, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her, there it is, by the washing of water with the word. With the word. The word of God is where, how we wash the filth in our mind. You know, during COVID, all of us are very familiar about washing hands, Right? We're so good, right? I didn't get sick at all, you know, because we, we're so hygienic now, right? Everywhere, you know, when we wash our hands, we know what it, how it works. You, you don't even do it quickly. You do it for 20 seconds. You, you scrub it and everything. Why? Because during the day, your hands will touch different things. You tear doorknobs and whatever, phone, and, and then the germs and COVID goes into our hands. And if we don't care careful, we, it goes in us, and that's how we get infected. Well, use the same concept with our mind. During the day, maybe we'll be watching something, you know, lustful or whatever it is. We get angry, we get mad, or there's a temptation, whatever it is. So that's why when we come home or during the day, we need to wash our brain, our mind, with a godly soap called the Word of God. Not just for two seconds, but for at least 20 seconds, right? 20 minutes, or whatever it is. Don't just, you know, no. Meditate, scrub your mind, scrub it, you know, scrub it, scrub it, scrub it so that kill the germs. And you do this. That's why, church, I'm telling you right now, if you're not reading your word and meditating on a daily basis, you are really vulnerable to get infected. Read your word. This is the soap. Every day, God gives you the Bible for a reason. People died for the Bible. Please, church. Once a week on Sunday is not enough. Read your words. Meditate it. Study it. Because just like people don't wash their hands, they get sick. Christians don't read their Bible and they get sick. And that's what Hosea says. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, knowledge of God's word. 
That's why there's so many people fall into sin because they don't wash their brain with the godly soap. Let me give you an example why I, I, I believe that, you know, everything that's happening in the world right now is against God's word and that we are tolerating and we become numb to it. Just let me give you a few here. I want to address so that you know where we stand as a church. Look, at it goes in Leviticus. If there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his wife, his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress must surely be put to death. That's how serious God is about sexual purity. Now, please understand. Don't get me wrong. Sex is from God. God created sex for enjoyment between a husband and wife, between a man and a woman, husband and wife, in a prayer of marriage. So please don't, don't misunderstand that, okay? We're not against sex. God is for sex. He created us as a sexual being. But he's very clear. Anybody committing adultery, put them to death. That's how serious it is. But today is normal. It's accepted, even in the church. You just heard it. A testimony. And I heard it from another person that used to go to his church. He is a Sunday school teacher. And he told me that he goes to a big church in, in DFW here. I won't tell you which church. But he says, Pastor Ed, many of my Sunday school teachers, they swap wives. I said, seriously? I, said, I asked like two, three times. You, you, in your Sunday school teachers, among other teachers, they actually swap wives in a Baptist church. Okay? And yet God says, anybody come in and tell put them to death. Here's one about homosexuality. If there's a man who lies with his, I'm sorry, this is incest. If there is a man who lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall be surely be put to death. It's God's word. Incest. Put them to death. This is the homosexual. If there's a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable. Notice what he would use. It, it grows God out. It's make God puke. Detestable act. They shall surely be put to death. This is why we as Christians, we need to be grossed out when we see LGBTQ thing. Love the people. We, they need Jesus. But we need to be grossed out. Don't ever get, oh, it's okay. It's just a different orientation, blah, blah, blah. Never. God never tolerate that. He just put them to death. And here's another one about, oh, crazy. If there is a man who lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death. You get the pattern there? You shall also kill the animal. If there's a woman who approaches any animal to mate with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Now, you may think, that's really people are doing that? Well, the reason God put it in the Bible because it was happening. 20 years ago, I remember about 20 or 20, you know, when I was pastoring, I remember hearing a survey that 5% of the population in, Amer in North America practice bestiality. That's how sick we have become because we have denied the truth. That's how sick it is. And God is serious when it comes to sexuality. God is saying, keep yourself pure. So pure that he even puts a verse about our bed in Hebrews 13, verse 4. This is what it says. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterers and all the sexual, sexually immoral. God loves marriage. And he wants our master bedroom, the bed, is to be enjoyed only between a husband and a wife, a male and a female. No one else. And God hates immorality. You know why? As I conclude, you know why? It's because marriage is a picture of God's relationship with us, the church, as his bride. That is the picture. Marriage is a picture of the ch relationship between the, the church and Jesus Christ. You know, when I was looking for a wife, I mean, I, I, I like a lot of things. You know, I want her to be tall, pretty, blah, 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 all that. But there's two things that I will not compromise. There were two things I put in, a, in my top list to God. I said, God, this is the two things I will ask for my wife. For my, number one, she has to be 
a believer that loves God. But number two, I ask, because you know, I want her to be a virgin. Because if I want to give my virginity to her, I want her virginity as well. And it be kept just between the two of us. And God has blessed me with both. And I'm proud in his godly way. And here's my point by that, me saying that. If I, as an imperfect human being, as a man, I desire a virgin bride, how much more God, who is pure and holy, requires and wants so much to have a virgin bride as well. And you and I are the virgin bride. So keep ourselves pure sexually, church. You know, John had a vision. And one of the climax that he saw in heaven in Revelation 19 goes like this. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud pearls of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory, Him glory for the what? The wedding feast of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Who is His bride? It's us, the church. But look at the next line. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given, to, given her to wear. And this fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. When I saw my bride walking down the aisle with that white gown, I was so proud because I know she's a virgin. That white stands for purity. Now, please understand, church, if there's any of us here who has fallen, or married, not a virgin son. This is not a message of condemnation because if we come to the Lord and repent, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this is not a message of condemnation, but it is a message that we need to make ourselves right with God. If there is sexual sin in our life right now, we need to deal with it because God will not tolerate that. You know why I know that? Because as I was preparing this message, I was reminded about a, a, a parable that Jesus gave to his disciples. He said, the kingdom of God is like a king who gives a wedding feast, preparing a wedding feast for his son. And he invited all kind of people into the wedding, but a lot of people refused it. So he told his servant, just keep on inviting even all the sinners and so on. And so finally they all came. And then there was a one, when, when the king came into the party, he saw a person that did not have the proper attire. And this is what it says. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there was not dressed in a wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come into the here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Remember we talked about the wedding gown earlier, wedding clothes? The righteous act of the saints. And the man says, I, I, I don't know. When we meet God again and God says, why are you committing adultery? Why are you still addicted to all kind of stuff? Why are you doing this? What are we going to say? Oh, Satan makes me do it? Or is it because of this or that? We'll be speechless. And look what the king did to this man. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. That verse always hit me. I want to be chosen because God called many people, but not everyone will be chosen. And I hope you and I, that we want to be chosen too. God is calling all of us to be his bride. But you have to be willing. Say, Lord, use me. Yes, I've fallen, but I'm willing, God, to make it right with you. So as we conclude, now let's go back again. You got to be cruel to be kind. And so in a few moments, we're going to bow our heads and close our eyes. And I want to remind you again that David that we talked about was such a horrible sinner. But the reason why he was still able to keep his kingdom, and the reason why his name was kept to be honorable name, 
is because he was repentant. Just read Psalm 51. Actually, I prepared that song, but I guess it's not working, and that's why they're here. Is it? Is it working, Psalm 51? No? Okay. The song that says, Create in me a clean heart. I was actually going to play that, and I was going to ask all of you to uh, just, while the song was being played, let's, let's do introspection in our own hearts. Let's not look at anybody else. Let's look at our own hearts. Can we do that? Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. Is there any areas in our life right now that we have not been pure? Men and women, have we compromised in any area of our life when it comes to sexual sin? If the Holy Spirit is convicting us, please do business just like the prodigal son or just like David cry out to God that God will cleanse our heart he will forgive us he will embrace us he will make us virgin again pure and holy before him so that when the day comes that he calls us we will be that bride given a bright linen gar uh, garment And we can celebrate a wedding feast so that we're not kicked out. So let's pray. Just invite him. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all stand together as we close. And as you go from this place, church, if you came here as a family, talk about this. Let's hold each other accountable that we talked about last week. It's not about living a perfect life, but living a humble life that we're willing. If we made a mistake, there's no more condemnation in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1 says. So if you talk to a brother or a sister and say, hey, I'm struggling in this area, there's no room for condemnation. Like Galatians 6, 1 says, let's help our brothers and sisters who are struggling in this area. Do it humbly. Do it gently so that we too will not fall into temptation. God is expecting a beautiful, pure bride. And as your pastor, I want CCI to come to that point that we too can receive the beautiful garment from the Lord so that when we come before Him one day, we'll be invited, we'll be chosen. Father God, I want to thank you, Lord, so much, Lord, for this difficult message, but I know, God, that is needed message today. We live in such a world and a time where it's crazy, where people celebrate evil and condemn righteousness. But God, as your bride, we will not compromise. We will hold your word.